Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to Northmont Church. And I see there's a lot of new faces out there, so I'll go over some housekeeping rules. Uh, the first one is if we have to leave the sanctuary in a quick but orderly manner, there's two different ways to get out of this building. The first one would be over here to my left. That's a good way to go. It takes you out the Rolls House Road. Or if you want to sit in front of the church while we're waiting for the fire engines, go straight out through that back door. Now, if your emergency is a more of a personal matter, the restrooms are to the back and down the right-hand side toward our education wing. You'll see a couple of water fountains. It's down the steps. Or if you're looking for a handicap restroom, we have one right over here to the right of us. Any other kind of emergencies, feel free to ask our uh, ushers. Hopefully they know what they're doing. Ted is an excellent example. <laughs> As I said, welcome to Northmont. And this is a big day for us because we're going to be installing our ninth pastor. Our very first pastor, a, I have to get my paper out because I don't want to butcher his name. Roderick Lee Smith. See, were you here for that, Dave? I believe it. That was 1925. <laughs> and we've had a storied body of people lead us over the last 93 years, of which Dave has been here for most of them. <laughs> and it's a proud day for us. And I have to say that as the, uh, the chair of the PNC, I think we've done a good job. And uh, I'd like to recognize the committee because of the work that they put in was selfless. It was long hours. And we, you know, basically tried to feel the spirit, fill our souls. So I'd like to uh, make special recognition of Cheryl English, Karen Newtbar, Julia Zerbach, Terrace Dufle, Craig Garver, Glenn Wisner, who makes excellent meatballs, by the way, and Logan Davis. So, like I said, this is a big day for us, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the next, oh, I don't know, say 20 years of service with uh, Reverend Ben. And so let's go ahead and get started with the worship. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach us your ways. Do not let me stray from your commandments. May I never walk from your love. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. May all God create you praise the Lord. Come, let us worship God. Friends, will you please rise in body or in spirit for the call to confession? We are a great cloud of witnesses, lifting each other up when we fall. We praise together and we pray together for ourselves and for each other. Let us go before God, giving over what would otherwise lead us astray. Let us pray now together and then silently. Holy and merciful God, it is not enough for us to know your ways, but we must live them. You call us to love in extraordinary and astonishing ways, but when we fall short, when we abuse or ignore your word, we call on you again. Write your statutes on our hearts, that we might be the people of your promise. Restore us and renew us, that justice may again roll down. May we live your truth now and always. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Please enter into a moment of silent confession. bring any charge against us? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and interceding for us. For I am convinced that neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, 
neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. be seated. And now let us pray. Holy God, living word, by the prompting of your spirit, may we be inspired by these texts and move to action and deep faith as we hear your good news proclaimed. Give us insight, grant us wisdom and discernment, and open us to imagine new ways to work together for your kingdom. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Our first scripture reading for today is found in Psalm 119, verses 28 through 40. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, you can find that on page 567. Listen now for the word of God. My soul melts, for so melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Put false ways far from me, and graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your ordinances before me. I cling to your decrees, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I run the way of your commandments, for you enlarge my understanding. Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Turn my heart to your decrees and not to selfish gain. Turn my, ours, turn my eyes from looking at vanities and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise, which is for those who fear you. Turn away the disgrace that I dread, for your ordinances are good. See, I have longed for your precepts, and in your righteousness, give me life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hi. 
So right now you're either thinking one of two things. Either A, Sarah got taller and uglier, or man, the ego on this guy, he has to preach his own installation service. Gosh, they are in for something. In reality, of course, uh, Liam uh, has croup, and so it got a little bit worse today, and so uh, and it happened two hours ago that it got a little bit worse, and so Sarah had to call me and say, um, I think you're going to have to preach. So I am, uh, since they're not here, I, I have Llama Llama Red Pajama, just, just so I <laughs> would feel that he was here with us, and I'm wearing Sarah's stole. So uh, they are here in spirit. They'll listen to this later and they'll shake their heads. <laughs> Our second piece of scripture comes to us from Jeremiah 31. This beginning in the 31st verse. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, where I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will not be like it will not be like the covenant that I made with the ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. These two, my friends, are God's words for us this day. So this is all Sarah's. So if it's good, you know where it came from. And if it's stunk, it's all delivery. <laughs> I've been telling everyone here at Northmont that they will be hearing Sarah preach and that they will think to themselves, we perhaps have hired the wrong Robins. And so I feel like now you're getting B team, but Northmont is always getting B team, at least in my household. And speaking of my household, we have this tradition. Uh, I think it was born mostly out of uh, fatigue or necessity or just needing something to do uh, with ourselves after a, a Christmas Eve service. And uh, with many, many pastors in my family, we just, uh, we all have services on Christmas Eve. And so um, when we finally get home and we're exhausted and doing the whole thing, Sarah and I usually turn on uh, the film Love Actually. Now me, if you, if you heard me say Love Actually, you had an instant reaction. It was either, oh, really? Or, ooh, I love the love, actually. It was one of the two. There's no in-between, as far as I'm concerned. It's, one, it's the one with Hugh Grant and Emma Thompson and uh, Liam. I just saw that. Uh, that's why. Liam Neeson and a bunch of other people. As kind of, you had some young actors. Who was the young actress in there? I'll forget her name. Anyway. It's a, it's a good film. It's a cute film. It's the kind of movie that just kind of gets you used to, you know, just in the mood for things. Um, now, I know that, again, this is not exactly everyone's cup of tea, and that's okay, but um, I'm bringing it up to you, or Sarah's bringing it up to you, because uh, in the midst of all of the busyness that is life, to be a part of a church especially, there are still some things that we need to get done, and there are truths that we need to share one with another. And in the middle of our living room, just to take you back to that place, in the middle of our living room, on Christmas Eve, we usually have to wrap a couple of gifts and things we just, you know, maybe purchased the day before or something like that. And, um, we just, we listen to the movie in the background and uh, share a little word of love. And you may remember in this film the scene um, of a recently widowed stepfather, played by Liam Neeson, sitting on the bench. He's sitting there on the bench with his stepson, and uh, it's clear that his stepson, there's something, he has some problem. He hasn't really opened up to him, and they don't have a terribly close relationship anyway. And they're trying to desperately figure out, well, what's, what's wrong with him? What's he doing? So he sits him down, and he finally just asks him point, point blank. And it's already a time of immense grief. There's already a lot going on. And so the stepdad asks, and he's a bit nervous about the response, because he, he doesn't know him very well. It could be anything. It could be any imaginable problem. 
And so he says to him like this. He says, I know I should be thinking about mom, the kid says. I know I think I should be thinking about her all the time, and I am thinking about her all the time. But the truth is, I'm in love, and I was before she died, and there's nothing I can do about it. And so the dad kind of replies, well, aren't you a bit young to be in love? He's like 12. And he says, no. And he says, okay, all right, that's fine. Well, I, I got to say, I'm a little relieved, the stepfather says. And so the son says, well, why? He says, well, you know, the, the dad says, I thought it might be something worse. I thought it might be something really bad. And the son, at this point, goes to, looks at him straight in the eye and says, what on earth could be worse than the total agony of being in love? <laughs> and he had, a, he had a point. The dad kind of shrugs and said, yep, it's total agony. That one sentence, I think, speaks volumes. And it communicates something between them who are walking together side by side and trying to know each other a little bit more fully. And we finally get a, a chance to acknowledge something that had been eating at them and something that was hopefully going to bring them closer together. And while it might be a movie line, the truth that we hear rung through this story over and over again is this, that love is all around us. And that's the point of this movie. And love is hard, and this one sentence from a bright kid doesn't even come close to the love that God has for us. The depth of love that God has for us. We get to see that love and the agony around it crystal clear, not only in this film, not only in our own lives, but we also get to see it in this passage from Jeremiah. The context for the people in this passage includes a little bit of agony. They have lost everything. They've lost everything, their place, their home, their temple, their safety, and they feel unrecognizable to themselves. This is not a place that they have been before. And the prophet Jeremiah comes to them and speaks God's words of love and healing and promise, and he speaks them just when they need it the most. He is, in this way, God's mouthpiece and declares in the middle of agony of their daily lives that hope is certainly not lost and that God loves them. God, of course, knows of their losses, knows where things went wrong, and God, of course, and then finds a way to double down instead of abandoning them. But God offers them a new promise and a new covenant and the hope that goes with living into all of that. And so we are shared these words. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they will be my people. It's an astounding direct way of speaking right to our hearts that we are offered God's love through covenant through promise they are what hem us in they're what give us boundaries they help move us through life knowing that we are loved and God has etched those things into us through law through covenant through word the essence of knowing our creator right there in front of us God has access to the core of who we are, like no other relationship that we've ever seen or been in. And God establishes something new, and every single time, God says God's going to do a new thing. We know that we better watch out. We know that we better get ready. And we know that we better look to the things that we are thought to have been given and reimagine what life and those things could look like. Because otherwise, we are going to be gone. We are going to be lost forever. We will not be able to have any of those things again, those things that we dreamed of, but also the things that make us who we have been and who we are. For the people of Jeremiah's time, this was very good news to hear. This news that would allow them, even as everything else in their life had changed, it allowed them to remember that God could and will forgive and that God can and will stay with them, that God can and will push them forward into freedom and mercy. But it's not enough for people of Israel and Judah to know that they are tied to God once more. It's not enough for you and for me to be tied together as a church through promises and vows that 
I'll make here today. We'll make those things out of a joint love for God, but they are just the beginning of something. Because a covenant with God compels us to act and to follow. It shoves shoves us off our comfy couches, out of our boring committee meetings, out of the fog of complacency in church and routine, and it says to us, because of the safety and forgiveness God has offered me, God has offered all of us, we are free to start again. We are free to become new. We are free to try and to fail and to stretch and to grow, and all of those things are what make up this new covenant. In this season of Lent, we are asked to pause long enough and to look inside of ourselves, to look beneath the surface of our economic and political divides, to look hard at what we have allowed to become center stage in our lives in this past year. And then we prepare. We prepare for God to do a new thing. We prepare to experience this new covenant in the form and in the person of Jesus. Lent is a time to set aside to consider what we need to do from here. What we need to let go of. Because it's not the life that Christ is calling us to. It's time for us to set aside all of those hindrances that we have been holding on to until now. Because it's time for us to act. It's time for us to live by those words in our hearts, to follow the the direction that Christ is leading this community of faith to go in. And as we go about aligning ourselves in worship, in our education, in our service, and yes, even those budget meetings and everything else in between, We are those who Christ is asking to come. Come with me and follow. Do so knowing that you are all a part of that same covenant together. Called by the same God. Desiring that the community and grace and joy that we experience here at Northmont is seen and known by those around the world. God never does one thing at a time. So if God has written the law on your hearts to love God and to love neighbor and to love the stranger, what else has God etched into you? What else has God written on your hearts? Because try as I might, after 15 years almost of marriage, I am not a mind reader. Still not a mind reader. I've taken classes, but I can't get there. And it's hard to believe that I can't. Only if wishing made it so. I cannot tell you what you are thinking right now, what this church is thinking and hoping in its mind about where we should go and the journey that's before us. So consider for a moment, what has your prayer life been telling you? What is written on your heart that needs to be uncovered? What does your pastor need to know about where God is calling this church to next? And as you ponder that thing, grab that little bag that you were given when you came in. Get a little bag? Some of you have a little bag? Sarah prepared each and every one of those by hand, so we're going to get them out, and we're going to use them. (laughs) So in that bag, there are two hearts And there's one little writing utensil. And one of those hearts is for me, actually. And one of them is for you to take home. But with that utensil, you'll write the same words on each heart. You'll share what it is that you know Northmont is called to do next. Out of the security and love and forgiveness that God offers. Because we want to know what is etched on your heart. Our hearts need to follow where God is leading us next. And our covenant with God compels us to keep moving and to keep changing and to keep striving. Our hope comes from knowing that God's law of love and grace challenges us to see Christ in a whole new way. God's compelling love for us is many things. It can be agony. It can be overwhelming. It can be anything in between. It will be, of course, tempting for us 
in these next few months together as we begin this journey to come and just do things the way that we have normally done them. It will be almost automatic to help me to try to fit into what is already here and what we're already doing. But let the knowledge of God's covenant with us and God's call make some room for us to try something else. Because a pastor isn't called to be really good at doing church. We are all called to be bearers of the promise that God has laid within us. May your hearts follow God always. And may this community be blessed in that journey. May Christ's astonishingly good news of forgiveness be etched anew in us each and every day. And to God be the glory this day and forevermore. Amen. Will you please join me in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The offering today will be collected for the old man... Memorial Fund, which is a scholarship fund providing financial aid for inquirers or candidates under the care of the Pittsburgh Presbytery as they prepare for church-related work in the PCUSA. We thank you for your generosity. Will the ushers please come forward?
Beloved in Christ, let us join in together for the litany of gifts as found printed in your bulletin. As in one body, we have many parts, and each part has its own function, so all of us together with Christ are one body, and we all belong to each other. We have different gifts. If your gift is to hear God's word, speak it out with faith. If your gift is the heart of a teacher, teach what is true. Let officers work diligently for the people, and let those who serve the poor serve gladly. Friends, hear this statement on the mission of the church. We are called by God to be a sign in the world today of the new life that God intends for all. In our life together, we are to display the new reality that sin is forgiven, reconciliation accomplished, and the dividing walls of hostility torn down as the living body of Christ. The church is called to proclaim the good news of salvation, to present the claims of the gospel on people's lives, and to demonstrate Christ's love in service to the world. We are called to undertake this mission even at the risk of life, trusting God in all things. In faith, we embrace a new openness to what God is doing in our time, a renewed obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ, and a new joy in our common worship and work. The ministry of the church is shared by pastor and people so that all together may fulfill the mission to which we are called in Jesus Christ. The particular responsibility of the ministry of the word and sacrament is to build up the church and serve the people of God so that the word may be rightly proclaimed and the sacraments rightly celebrated. The call to this ministry has been extended by the congregation, accepted by your candidate, and approved by the presbytery. Therefore, Pittsburgh Presbytery, by means of its commission, now installs Benjamin Robbins as pastor for Northmont Church. In his baptism, Ben was clothed with Christ. He was ordained to the ministry of word and sacrament and is now called by God through the voice of this church to serve as pastor of this congregation. Ben, I have a few questions for you. And I will give you the answers. Oh, okay. All right. I think I've played this role before, okay. Okay. Ben, do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, Acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, answer, I do and I will. I do and I will. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? If so, answer, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Will you be governed by our church's polity? And will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, answer, I will with God's help. <laughs> I will with God's help. Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, answer, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, answer, I do. I do. Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with 
energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, answer, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Will you be a faithful minister of the word and sacrament, proclaiming the good news in word and sacrament, teaching faith and caring for God's people? If so, answer, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Will you be active in government and discipline, serving in the councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, answer, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. All right, at this time, I would invite forward a representative from the congregation, Mr. Pat Kelly, to ask the questions of the congregation. Hi, I'm Pat. <laughs> <clears throat> Do we, the members of the church, accept Ben as our a pastor chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to guide us in the way of Jesus Christ? Do we? Yeah. We do. Do we agree to pray for him, encourage him to respect his decisions, and to follow the guides us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do we? Yeah. We do. Do we promise to pay him fairly and provide for his welfare as he works amongst us, to stand by him in trouble and to share his joys? Do we? We do. Will we listen to the word he preaches, welcome his pastoral care, and honor his authority as he seeks to honor and obey Jesus Christ our Lord? Do we and will we? We do and we will. We do and we will. Thanks. And now we've reached the time for the prayer of installation. And so, Ben, I would invite you to stand next to me here so that I can reach. And we, I will invite all um, teaching elders, ruling elders, those ordained to come forward for the laying on of hands as we pray for Ben. Have just gone out there. I know. Praise be to God. Let us pray. We praise you, gracious Lord, for you alone are God. You have made us, and we are your people, the sheep of your pasture. You have led us to green meadows by cool waters, satisfying our every need with your love. You have shown us paths that are right. Through shadowed valleys of despair, you have been our comfort and our hope. Over long generations, your presence has sustained your people. In your good time, you sent Jesus, your only beloved, to be our shepherd. He knew and loved your own, calling all who would hear to follow him. The good shepherd laid down his life for us, risking the cross for the hope of resurrection. By the power of the risen Christ, you gathered the church together to live for you in newness of life, a holy nation, a priestly family, a people chosen as your own and called to proclaim your marvelous love. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that we may be faithful as your people and fruitful in the ministries you have given us. Grant diligence to those who lead, faith to those who teach, truth to all who speak, compassion to those who heal, wisdom to those who counsel, generosity to those who give, and cheerfulness to all who serve, to your servant, Benjamin, and to all who tend your flock as pastors among your people. Give vision and strength, hospitality, humility, and peace. Bless the common ministry of this pastor and the people with joy and power in the gospel. Strengthen us to live out the grace of our baptism and to serve you with the gifts of your Holy Spirit. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our only shepherd and Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated, but Ben, you have to stay here. Huh. 
Benjamin Robbins, as a minister of the word and sacrament in the Church of Jesus Christ, you are now installed as pastor for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. is something you've probably never thought about if you're not a pastor. When Ben and Brian and Laura and every pastor here today took our ordination vows, we lost something. When we became pastors, we lost our pastors. Now understand, pastors do not do our work by ourselves. We have the good folks at the Presbytery who advise us. We have colleagues and pastor groups and spiritual directors and therapists sometimes to guide us. We have friends and family to support us. We have congregations who love us most of the time. And some pastors like Ben are even married to pastors. But pastors don't have pastors in the same way the congregations have pastors. Now, I composed this charge in the midst of misery, otherwise known as a terrible, no good, very bad week, just like the Robins, I think. My elderly mother has been sick, and I was up with her for a few nights, so sleep deprivation colored my mood. My husband was out of town, of course. I had too much work to do and too little time to do it. I sat through some really boring meetings and some more productive meetings, but all of them left me exhausted. My son was more needy than normal. My cats were needy, but let's face it, cats are always needy. By Friday night, I sank into my family room couch, exhausted. I turned on the TV, and I could swear the people on the screen were saying words, but they made no sense. It was like Charlie Brown's teacher, womp, womp, womp. And I sat there on the sofa, a lumpy old lump of Susan, and I thought, you know what I need right now more than anything? I need a pastor. Not to tell me what to do not to cheer me up, not to tell me how I am messing up, not to hold my hand. I needed a pastor to remind me that I am God's beloved child. I need a pastor to invite me back into God's story, which is a much better story than I could ever write for myself. And here's the thing, Ben. If the good people at Northmont Presbyterian Church are anything like me, they are busy. They are frazzled. Sometimes they are moving through life at warp speed, and sometimes they are sitting in traffic on McKnight Road. They are moms and dads in the thick of that impossibly difficult, way beyond wonderful job of raising children. They are dealing with the needs of aging parents, or maybe they have discovered that they are the aging parents. They are young people who measure their worth by their SAT scores and what they see on the screen of their smartphones glowing at the dark at 1 a.m. when they should be sleeping. They are people who long to have a family or are trying to recover from the family they had. They work too hard at jobs they hate or are so in love with their jobs they have very little to give to anyone else. If they are anything like me, the good people of Northmont are people doing the best they can to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ in the midst of messy, complicated lives. 
You know what the good people at Northmont need? They need a pastor. And Ben, God has decided the pastor the good people at Northmont need is you. Not to tell them what to do, although your gifts for leadership will be important as Northmont seeks to be a vital community of faith and serve God's people in the North Hills. Not to cheer them up, although I predict your sense of humor will be one of the gifts of your ministry here that will be long remembered after you're gone. Not to tell them how to fix their lives, although if you prioritize your life with Sarah and Liam, you will demonstrate God's intentions that our lives are not about what we achieve, but by how we treat the hearts God has entrusted to us. The people don't even really need you to hold their hand. Although your servant's heart and ears will lead you to hospital beds and nursing homes and coffee shops and all those holy spaces where silence and secrets and deep sorrows are shared and kept close, there will be hand-holding. What the good people at Northmont really need is a pastor. They need you, Ben. Because when they stumble or skip or limp or drag themselves into this sanctuary on Sunday morning or any other day of the week, really, they will have forgotten again who they are. They will wonder again, does this matter? They'll wonder, is any of this true? Nadia Boltz Weber says that pastors have pretty good job security because God's people, even the really faithful ones are forgetful. She says that those of us called to be pastors cannot assume that just because people leave on Sunday believing the gospel, they will still believe it a day, a week, or even an hour later. The pastor's job, she says, is to put Jesus in the people's ears and mouths and do it again again and never stop until the kingdom comes. So Ben, do that. Take every opportunity every day in all that you do to remind the people of their baptismal identity in Jesus Christ. Remind them that being beloved children of God is enough. It's more than enough. Make your ministry here at Northmont be about inviting people back into God's story of love and forgiveness and grace. And never, ever stop pointing to Jesus Christ, who is the pastor of us all. And now, Ben, may God bless you and keep you. May the face of God shine upon you. May God look upon you with love and with favor. May God bless you with energy, imagination, intelligence, and love, and give you peace on this joy-filled day, on this kind of weird day, on those hard, no good, very bad days, and all the ordinary days in between. Amen. Good afternoon. When Ben sent out the assignments, I was thrilled to be given the charge to the congregation. Because if there's one group of people that I've gotten very comfortable saying hard things to, <laughs> it is the good people of Northmont. Due to our history of my time here and working th with you in this last season, I've become very comfortable telling you hard things. And what I realized is that the full charge to the congregation I gave you on February 4th in a 28-minute sermon. <laughs> and I shared that with my wife. And she laughed and she says, you know darn well that if you go 28 minutes that you are not going to ever be welcome back there again. <laughs> so I'm going to go 27. No. My charge for the congregation comes today from the book of Hebrews. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy, of joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Growing up in high school, I ran cross country. And every single time we ran a cross country race, we had to go to the park where it was, and we had to walk the course. Now, every race was the same length. It was 3.1 miles. And you might think, well, it's the same distance. It's the same amount of time. Why do you need to walk the course? Because every cross country course is a little different. There are hills at different spots, there's turns, there's flat spaces, there's wooded spaces, there's places where you can pass, and there's, pace, and there's places that you can't. And it's important to realize as a runner that every single race that you run is going to be a little different. I have run the Pittsburgh Half Marathon three times, and every time I've done it, it's been very different. One year it was 42 degrees, and one year it was 72 degrees. And the way that you run a race when it's 42 and the way that you run a race when it's 72 degrees are very, very different. Now there is a danger when you get a new pastor to assume that this pastor will be like the last pastors. If you're here on February 4th, this should sound familiar. I'm going to remind you again. I know your last three installed pastors. Dr. Stephen Polly, Dr. David Antonson, and Dr. Jack Lowell. They were all fine, faithful men who served this congregation faithfully. And Ben Robbins is not any of the three of those men. And the greatest disservice you will do to yourself is to imagine or pretend that he is. He's uniquely gifted in his own ways. He has strengths and talents that none of them have. He has weaknesses where some of them had strengths. He is not any of those three men. And so my simple charge to you is this. You are about to begin a new race. It is an exciting race. Ben is gifted and called and excited to come serve the people of Northmont. My charge to you is simply this. This is a new race. This is a new season. You are not the church you were. Ben is not like any pastor you have ever had before. So as you prepare for this season of ministry, I charge you to do this. To walk the course. Get to know Ben. Get to know Sarah. Get to know Liam. Get to know his strengths. Get to know his passions. Get to know what breaks his heart and what brings him joy. Walk the course for the race that you are about to run. For as you walk the course, as you get to know this season of ministry, you will do yourself well, and you will do Ben and his family well to take the time to get to know him, to get to know yourselves and who you are in this season in order that you might be the church that God is calling you to be. As you prepare to run this race with perseverance, as the author of Hebrews says, take time, get to know Ben, get to know his family, and may the ministry partnership that we celebrate on this day be one that bears fruit for the kingdom from this place to the places where you are now and to the whole world.
as we celebrate communion here together, um, a few things for you to know. First, the hearts that you drew on, if you wouldn't mind bringing them up as you come to receive communion, we would appreciate it. Just put them on the front pew right here uh, as, as you take communion. Uh, there will be different stations of individuals for intinction, and so you may come up depending on wherever you are, whatever makes the most sense. And uh, you'll receive the elements here, uh, the bread and the cup, and so uh, go ahead and consume them right away, and then return to your seats uh, as you came up. So let us, as we begin, pray the prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Represented here are, well, a lot of Presbyterians. <laughs> are there any non-Presbyterians here? Pseudo-Presbyterians? Wannabe? Okay, no. I see at least, let's see, we've got a, we've got a Mount Nebo, we've got some Highlanders over here, we've got Washington Presbytery even over on this side, watch out. We've got, uh, let's see, who's, uh, East Liberty, I think. Where do you go? Yeah? Okay. And then we've got North Monters, and we've got... I don't, yeah, that's a, is that about it? It's about it. What's that? Oh, Wilkins. Oh, okay, how's it going? <laughs> we have much to celebrate and many in, in Presbytery, fine. And so we have, <laughs> by way of Buffalo, I think, is it Buffalo? Whatever. You and I have much to celebrate and we also have uh, much around us to be thankful for. And as we embark on being the church, as we strive to be those who are willing witnesses to Christ, we come together in times like these to be reminded of what is good and what is simple. These elements that we celebrate this afternoon are commonplace. It's from Shop and Save, I think. But basically, so am I, and so are you. You and I are the people that God has called, as simple and as awkward and as everything else that we are, to be the people who go into the world to proclaim good news and to ensure that that faith and love that you and I embrace so much is a part of their lives as well. And so we go before God this afternoon, taking those simple elements And going back to Mount Nebo, and to East Liberty, and to Buffalo, Presbytery, whatever. And going back to Washington and everywhere else that we are to proclaim good news. Because this is who we are as the people of God. This is what these elements mean to us. And this is why we are here. Because you and I are blessed enough to be people who proclaim good news in our daily lives. And luckily, as we do these things, we have words given to us by the Apostle Paul, who tells us this. That on the night of his arrest, our Savior took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you, and for you, and for you, and for you. And do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. All of you. Do this in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. My friends, from everywhere, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. And all is ready.
think so. Yes, sir. <laughs> Will you please pray with me? God, it is good for us to be here to commune with you, to commune with our fellow saints, and to be reminded of who we are and whose we are. In this sacrament, we are called to be your disciples. We are reminded of our identity as your beloved. And we are asked to be Christ-like for each other, to know you, and to share you with all we meet. We thank you that we can celebrate this and all of the work of the church in one place. We pray that you will send us from here as your people to reflect your light and to be hope for others. We pray now the prayer that you taught us saying, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
me invite um, all of those who were participating in the service uh, to just ready yourself to am scray out of here in a moment after the benediction, just so you're prepared. Friends, you and I are embarking on something, whether you are a member of this congregation or are simply here to support the ministry of this place. And you and I are doing this because God is not contained to this little building, but we go off into all those places that I mentioned to reflect that same love and compassion to all we meet. And as we do so, we remember the promises that we adhere to and that we are called to in this place, that all of us are supposed to be those who are fighting for the peace and unity of this church. We are all those people who ensure that we are loving with compassion and with conviction and with heart. We are all those who are called to ministry because we are people of faith. And thankfully, as we embark on this good work, we never do these things alone. But we go forward with the faith and the compassion and the hope of the one who claims us and redeems us and sustains us now and always. Amen.